Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. The Seminole Wars podcast goes west today. We cover Seminole resistance to removal, of course, but we owe it to the memory of those Seminoles removed to keep their story alive as well. For many, that story continues in Oklahoma. What became of those Seminoles? How are they faring today? How do they maintain their unique cultural identity in the 21st century? Joining us is Jake Tiger. Jake is a cultural outreach specialist for the Seminole Nation in Wewaka, Oklahoma. He hand sews traditional Seminole garments and wears them to public events to promote Seminole culture and to remind everyone the Seminole are still around. He has the heart of a true living historian, willing to speak to even only one person at an event if it furthers awareness of the Seminole. Usually, of course, he speaks to many, many more. He is young, full of charisma, and he's our guest today, Jake Tiger. Welcome to the Seminole Wars. Thank you for having me out here today. Jake, what does it mean to be a Seminole in the 21st century? Uh, what it means to be Seminole here in the 21st century, to me, it's, it's about carrying on a tradition and being not a culture keeper, but trying to share it and make sure it still progresses on in later years as a Seminole. That's my understanding is to look out for one another and try to make our lives as easy as possible for one another. And it's all about just the land and the people and family. And that's the three main things. What do those three main things mean to you? So the land, we kind of have this saying we call it the seminal worldview. My understanding is when we don't have anything in terms of the land or language or anything that pertains to our culture that helps us identify as seminal, we then become a special interest group. Looking through history, Seminoles are uh, predominantly agriculturally based people. And that just goes back to our, what we call the inherent sovereignty. Now we're not really waking up to sovereignty in regards to the McGirt versus Oklahoma decision. This is an inherent right that was given to us to a higher power that put us here and allows us to use all the land that we can and in return, we take care of it. That's what that means to me. What I really try to do is wanting to live like I'm back in the 1820s, but also enjoying the modern conveniences, say like having air conditioning. But it's more of just having that knowledge because you never know one of these days it'll come in handy once again, whether it's flint napping or starting a fire with flint and steel or brine tanning or how to butcher a deer, traditional fishing, foraging, anything in regards to that. That's what I try to focus on. What's your part in the Seminole Nation? I work here in the Seminole Nation Historic Preservation Office here in Seminole County. And what my main job to do is education and outreach. And I do that with in regards to my textiles or going out to universities at all or maybe doing a lean-to camp and showing people what life was like way back then and really try to do and capture that through a visual standpoint. A lot of people don't want to sit around and listen to a lecture all day. Maybe we want to see something that is really going to capture their attention and firmly grasp what my words actually going to project onto them. Well, so what's your schedule been like in doing this outreach? November is pretty busy for Native American Heritage Month. I've been all over the place. People have been emailing me, calling me, wanting to come out to any of our high school or university or park or museum and just talking about similar lifestyle. That's what I'm really working on is trying to get my message out to the masses, not just having a group of people. It's good to have a group of like-minded people, but we need to really educate and change the hearts of some that aren't educated in this field and try to see us in a respectful manner. Once they learn our story, then they begin to understand us and see why we're protesting for certain rights and why we're fighting so hard to reclaim our identity. A lot of it is in regards to textiles, but I've also educated myself in fields of brain tanning and flint napping and anything in terms of that with the dart wrapping and using a river cane blowgun, something like that to show people not just a one-sided view on 
what a seminal is. And whether if I'm dressing up like Nick and Nubby or if I'm dressing up as just a fur trapper, anything in regards to that, we all weren't just one homogenous group of people. We all had our own identities and tried to project that. When it first started out was the, the textiles. And while the inspiration came from my grandfather, he did a lot of that work growing up. And it just kind of came naturally to me. Once he passed away, I saw it as my responsibility to pick that up because I was around that a lot. And I would hate to see that much work go to the wayside and be uh, forever gotten. Just like how I have, he researched it, but also uh, had a lot of teachings from his own tribal elders also. I kind of see this as a relay race. We're all just carrying on that baton until we get to the finish line, basically. And saving the Seminoles, it's more of just a decolonization process, if that uh, makes any sense at all. It's about looking out for one another and trying to make our lives easier and not trying to tear one down, but trying to look out for one another and remind us that we're all, at the end of the day, we're all still, we're Seminoles. The Seminole had land that they were pleased with and that they gave back to, but the U.S. government removed them to Oklahoma, and there the Seminoles had to start from scratch. Being taken out of this beautiful landscape that we call Florida and then brought here to Oklahoma, which is a, a completely different climate. This is an eradication process. They took us out of perfect farming land and they brought us to Oklahoma, where it's more of just hills or sandstone and soil. We weren't given the luxuries of having certain amenities that other tribal nations would have been given. They said we would be prosperous through assimilation. It was just the eradication of our identity. You trace your ancestry too? Dwayne Powell, he was a uh, Wynn clan. He came from the Miller on his father's side and the Powell on his mother's side. Mother was descendants of Osceola from the Powell family. Our band, we come from the Palmer Band. When we were later moved here to Indian Territory, we were called the Pascofa Band, our leader at the time that came here to Oklahoma. And there, there's really no, uh, there's, it's kind of hard to find the history behind the Tom Palmer Pascofa Band because we weren't really documented until like around the 1820s, I believe, in regards to us. I know there's some writings that wrote us down as hostile creeks, but also there's different speculations that we come from either Apalachicola people. It's kind of just up in the air. So I try not to correct people when we, when we say one thing because, you know, we we all don't have a, a definite answer. And I've, I've been taught not to belittle anyone with their, their knowledge and just take it and figure it out on my own. What's the process that you use? Well, the process I use, lucky for me, I have the opportunity to do this on a much larger scale, especially through the, the Seminole Nation. We have a lot of setbacks to the, the pandemic. I've always wanted to do moccasin making classes or a bow making class or anything in regards to that, maybe a brain painting class. Once we get that lifted, that's going to be my, one of my first things to do is try to bring that teachings back to the members of the Seminole Nation. All right. What are you making? Yeah, so I'm actually making just about anything you can think of because not a lot of people do that here, especially at my age. I'm 23 years old. I want that to, once again, go away. So I made that whole lot of gold to retain as much as I could. And you know, I first started out with just making moccasins and calico shirts. And then it later projected onto making leather leggings or a wool legging and then working on the ruffled coats or frocks, if you want to call them. And then going into beadwork, you know, with the bandolier bags. So now I'm at a point in time where I'm actually doing just full outfit nowadays. And I'm actually working on a display right now for the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma. It'll be on permanent display, but I'm working on a reproduction of Osceola's outfit in the Robert John Curtis painting of him down in uh, at Fort Moultrie. And that'll be going up early next year, the full body mannequin. So I do all my research on that outfit and... So that, that's in the works right now. It'll take a little while because uh, me as a historian, I try to do everything how it would have been done back then. So I don't use any sewing machines. I do everything by hand. Everything is hand sewn. <laughs> Actually, I just uh, finished a shirt today. I'm going down to New Orleans for a repatriation at a Jackson Barracks and we're also going to have a tour of Fort Pike. So I made a, a new calico shirt. And it might be a new record for myself. It's finishing a calico shirt in two days as hand sewn. Jake, how do you know to do these things? Luckily for me, when my grandfather passed away, we still had a whole bunch of his stuff. So I just went to his own personal collection and just kind of studied what he had. 
But also, I would go to reference different paintings or lithographs of the time and request photos from museum collections and try to see what they have. I talked to different historians, Brian Zapata and his brother Pedro and Harry Bowlegs and David Mott and the other Southeastern people in the area. We all work together. I love that about us is that we have a true passion for history and camaraderie that we have. So that's a lot of the stuff I try to know, really work on and try to project that out there is complete and total historical accuracy and try to make everything museum quality. And the tribes had distinctive styles, correct? If you're a textile artist or a historian who studies that, you'll see a lot of similarities in the Southeast in regards to the Muscogee Creeks that had a lot of similarities and similar clothing. But, you know, even down the Southeast, we had a lot of textiles, a lot of the, you can still differentiate different aspects of their clothing, whether it was Chickasaw or Choctaw or Cherokee or Yuchi, but it has its own certain look. And it's very unique to our particular region, if you would. And really neat to see other, how other tribal artists do it, whether if they're Choctaw or Cherokee, because I can relate to them, because just like them, we had a lot of trade items that were fabrics or trade silvers or anything in regards to that. But there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to that in regards to the clothing. And one of my mentors in this told me, he said, think of it in regards to modern day clothing. You're not going to wear a 1980s lens breaker and try to fit it in 2021. Clothing changes over time. It's fashion, basically. So you really got to look at if it's a, a painting from the time period or when the time of photographs start to come around and even look at inventory list stuff that they had at the time and try to get an accurate depiction of what was had in that era. And so therefore, you know, so like, so there's just a lot of misinterpretations, but uh, what's on one of my things I'm trying to fix that and try to show people is we don't want to make it look like LARPing, basically. We wanted it to look like we're a museum display that is alive. And even in that era, they had different clothes for different occasions. Yes. Yes. That's another big one is they dress up and try to say, oh, this I would dress every day. I said, well, that's wrong because they would only use that for special occasions if it's for going to a stomp dance or a treaty signing or going to the, the trading post. Anything where we, we need to look presentable, we would dress like that. But in reality, we want to worn layers of clothing down the southeast with the humid temperatures. You can even go you know, even back further than that. How we dressed back then was... The clothing was minimal. Women had uh, women skirts made out of twine, and the men would have animal furs or skin and wearing uh, feathered capes in regards to that. And that's why we were referred to as savages by the Europeans, because we didn't have a lot of clothing on due to our environment. You have the further challenge that clothing did change after removal, and so you've got to manage both years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then in regards to that, too, as a similar historian, I got to study both ends, too, after the removal because the clothing still changed. And down in Florida, they still wear what they called the big shirts and started to wear patchwork after that. And so I identify as similar in regards to that. But here in Oklahoma, we were forced to assimilate, and we had to wear cowboy hats and suits and ties and wearing boots and brogans. And so we interpreted wearing red satin vests with fringe to the ceremony grounds or wearing horsehair roaches. We still retain that through evolution and try to uh, do our environment also. So you got to look at it different in that aspect. If you're saying uh, similar, you got to look on both sides. What would wear in the 1870s and down in Big Cypress, Florida would be a lot different than what we'd be wearing here in Wawoka. In regards to how you're going to interpret your history to show that, that difference, and that's just the result of uh, removal and forced assimilation. Here in Oklahoma, a lot of that was lost due to the removal. We've seen a lot of that traditional clothing start to be taken away, especially after the Civil War. It's just a medium of comfort what we're wearing. Like, so we're not going to be wearing the calico coats every day. Uh, we probably probably put on a linen shirt that was loose and had let air flow through it. And maybe not even wearing a shirt. It might have just been leggings and uh, moccasins and a breech cloth, probably. Mm -hmm. Not sure you can trek around very comfortably in Oklahoma in the wintertime with such clothing. Yeah, the climate here is a lot different than what Florida. you got snow and tornadoes and all kinds of stuff. That's a little bit different than Florida regions. It does get pretty cold here during the winter months. And it's just a matter of dressing for our adaptation to the climate. So although you dress in what we say is modern clothing, by designing, making, and wearing the traditional clothing, remind everyone, Seminoles are still here. Yes, absolutely. Cause it's just to uh, remind ourselves that we're still the same people we were 200 years ago. 
the only thing that's changed us is technology. We can still speak our language and we can still take down a deer with a, a Bodark longbow. This is how we interpret it and try to make, not try to romanticize that lifestyle. Some people will tell me, oh, you're such a, a spectacle you're doing this. I said, well, not really, because how I see it, 200 years ago, this is just normal to you know do this kind of stuff. We're in this decolonization process. A lot of the stuff I do too when I when I mention this is there was a point in time where we weren't allowed to do this. We were prosecuted for going to ceremonies or speaking our language, and we weren't allowed to dress how we were for thousands of years. But now we're in a point in time where we are in a safe space to do that. It's our responsibility to honor those who weren't able to do that in their lifetime, but also honor those too that did that before them and still did that and let all those spirits know that we're still here and we're so proud of who we are. The nation was moved around a little bit within the Oklahoma Territory. And today? Well, primarily the eastern side of Oklahoma is predominantly the, the five tribes, the Seminoles, the Creeks, and Cherokees, and Choctaws, and Chickasaws. We all have our own territories here. And this is kind of going back in regards to the McGirt decision that was made last year. Supreme Court about returning original tribal jurisdictions to reservations that were never disestablished that are still under the control of the tribes here in the area. There's this mixture of it. There's a lot of Seminoles that live up north, northeast up towards Tulsa, but he's even going down to here in Seminole County. You know, how it went was during removal, of, there was three forts that were a lot of the five tribes were placed in. Fort Townsend was for the Choctaws. Chickasaws were placed at uh, Fort Washita. Seminoles, Creeks, and Cherokees were placed up in Fort Gibson. And uh, Fort Gibson is in northeast Oklahoma and was present day Muskogee. We were all kind of placed in that area. And at the time, that actually is Cherokee territory. And of course, the Cherokees came there first in 1824. And later, the Muscogee Creeks and then the Seminoles came through. The Seminoles, we were placed there. A lot of us were still placed under as prisoners of war, basically. And so we had a lot of mistreatment done to us even after removal. The federal government tried to have us side under the Muscogee Creek Nation under their jurisdiction, even though there was a lot of hostilities between the Seminoles and the Creeks at the time. But that's what we came about the, the Treaty of 1866, what we called the, the Treaty of the Creeks. And that's why we see the picture of Billy Bowlegs and John Jumper pictured in D.C. because they're having negotiations up there with the federal government and tried to create our own sovereign land. When was that final resolution agreed to? That was signed on August 7th, 1856, under uh, Principal Chief John Jumper. And of course, he fought in the, the Seminole Wars prior to all this. And like I said, Billy Bowlegs is still fighting what we called uh, the Third Seminole War and finally agreed to come to Oklahoma, or Indian Territory, when, once he found out we were going to have our own lands here. He had as long as he could, saying, why would I come to there if we don't have our own land? Even before that, that's why Wakaji went down to Mexico, because he didn't want to live under the jurisdiction of the Muscogee Creeks. He wanted his own territory to be sovereign. And so him and his followers went down to Mexico and created a town down there, down in uh, Cuscoilla. Back in Florida, Sam Jones had said, we don't need much. We can take a very small slither. Just leave us alone. Apparently, once the Seminole reached the Oklahoma Territory, the government took them up on that suggestion. Our original territory is actually started here in, in the Woka Seminole area, and even what was kind of like a skinny strip as it went all the way out to the to West Oklahoma, going through Oklahoma City and all the way out to Woodward. And the same with the Muscogee Creeks, their territories were on top of ours. So at one point in time, Oklahoma City was under the Seminole and Creek jurisdiction. The land run had a lot to do with that, and even the Dallas Commission had a lot to do with that. And disestablishing, or not, uh, I want to say, dis trying to dismiss tribal jurisdiction and try to give it to homesteaders. And that's what a lot of that was, was just, of course, uh, another form of eradication and tried to do away with our own prosperity at the time. Here amongst the five tribes, the Seminole Nation actually has the smallest land base compared to the other four tribes. Ours is significantly smaller than the others. Personally, I feel like that was more of a, a punishment towards us because we resisted the most during the removal. So, so I believe that was more of a, a punishment towards us in regards to getting a smaller piece of land. During the Seminole Wars, the rest of the world was laughing at the United States, making a, a laughing stock out of the United States. And how are you getting beat by a small group of Indians when y'all have a, a whole entire country and y'all can't take out this little group of Indians down in Florida? It was a costly war, too, during the Seminole Wars. And it went on for uh, the, what we call the First, Second, and Third Seminole War. It lasted 29 years. So you, you can see that there was a lot of hostility brought upon the Seminoles in regards to that because we resisted the most out of the other tribes. 
And the federal government's grand plan was to have the Creek and Seminole live together in happiness and harmony for all eternity. And when that couldn't fly... Under the Scotia Creek Territory, and they cut it out and just gave it to the, the Seminoles. They wanted originally to have us to be under the Muscogee Creek Nation and be under their rule and jurisdiction. And a lot of us weren't happy with that. And so there's a lot of people leaving the territory. Like I said, I mentioned Kowakaji went down to Mexico to be free of any type of condition. Seminole, re- Seminole who were removed west didn't find a much better life in Oklahoma, and some of the turmoil remained. Yeah. Yeah, there was still even turmoil even after the the Civil War, and that was a war that we uh, Seminoles wanted. It was in our treaty of 1856 was to be not involved in any conflicts in regards to the United States, any of their internal conflicts, and they told us we would be free of that, and we were forced to fight on both sides. So it wasn't really a choice to fight in the, the Civil War. We tried to remain neutral. And so, therefore, uh, we had a certain amount of vans that fought on the Confederate side. John Jumper was the commander on the Confederates. And the Union, we had John Chubco and Boscofa, and they fought with what they called the Loyal Creeks, both the Ahola and all those people that tried to remain neutral and try to stay away from the Civil War. They even went up as far as Kansas to stay away from this conflict. Then came Reconstruction and Payback. There was a Reconstruction Treaty after the Civil War. There was even hostility before that when... Uh, John Jeffer became chief. The chief would have been Kawakaji through having a selector and makers back then through traditional law. And he wasn't given that. So that was another reason why he went down to Mexico, because he was a nephew of Ekinavi. They're from the Oconee people. So therefore, that, that was even some hostility of that back then also. We even see some of that with the Cherokees during the, the Civil War, people rising up against John Ross when a uh, San Wadey joined the Confederates and were fed up with the Cherokee government at the time. Let's focus on you, Jake. Tell us the story with your band. From my understanding, my band settled near with the uh, Ufala band. Seminoles weren't just predominantly, formerly Muscogee Creek people. We had Miccosukee people and Hijiti and Chiaha and all other bands that came from these different tribal nations. And so therefore, we all had our own identities that we tried to retain. Even the bands, that we have a band here in present day, the Tawasu band. They, there's a band that separated from them, the Fasuchi, and even the uh, Tawasu a band even uh, left the uh, Tawasli. Except for the South Flacco Tribal Town is actually under the Missouri Creek Nation now. So here in Oklahoma, we still go by a, a clan system also, but we go by a band, which was given to us through our mothers. That would just be in regards to our tribal town, basically, and our people that we came from before. If the band was named after one of our leaders, if it was named after a certain phrase that we use, that's how we differentiate that. In regards to that, so technically there's 12 tribes within the Seminole Nation today Right now, we have 12 traditional bands and two freedmen bands. Technically speaking, we have 12 tribes within the Seminole Nation. That's why we call ourselves a nation, not just a tribe, and try to homogenize uh, us as a as just one group. A lot of that is just in regards to politics. No one's ever going to see eye to eye. But in reality, like I said, at the end of the day, we're still Seminoles, and we need to respect one another and come together to look out for the people and for our own, our own lands and look out for the four-leggeds and the ones in the skies and waters. You know, looking out for them, we need to set aside our, our differences. And there's just a lot of like, like hostility just in regards to politics, but that, that's just a given. The way I see it, at the end of the day, though, we're still Seminoles. How has the Seminole Nation adapted its governing procedures over the years? In regards to a traditional form of government, using uh, going through a band system, today here in the, the Seminole Nation, we probably have one of the most democratic forms of government because the people actually have a say-so, what goes on, what they, they have direct contact with, with the representatives. And we have, we have our council meetings, and we don't go by districts. We still go by a band system. So we have two representatives per band, and then we have the band chiefs. And we all meet before a council meeting. First, we'll do the band chiefs meeting, and then we'll have the, the band meeting. And then later on the council meeting, when the, the tribe decides to vote on any type of resolution. Some of it remains a mystery to outsiders, and maybe by design. Yeah, a lot of people do say that you can't talk about that. That's that's banned business. I understand, Jake, that in modern times, Seminole Nation has modified the eligibility and affiliation for different bands. Here in Oklahoma, with our band system, if our mother is in Seminole, now we can identify with our father's band. So that's another way of keeping that system going. But bands are not clans. What's the difference? Now, in regards to the clan system, I do know they have some clans down there in Florida that have died out, but we still have here in Oklahoma. 
one wonders if there's an opportunity to revitalize the, the clans that no longer are extant in the Florida tribe with those from the Seminole Nation in Oklahoma. Well, I haven't heard anything about clans trying to revitalize through that. I think that that's far beyond the federal government's outreach. That's more of a traditional law. One thing that's died out both here in Oklahoma and in Florida is the, the languages. We don't speak just one language. And that's one thing we're trying to work on is a lot of the Seminoles down in Florida speak the Ilabungi Miccosukee language. Here we speak the Muscogee language, and it's kind of opposite. We don't speak the Miccosukee here, but down there, they have a need for Muscogee speakers. So that's one thing that we want to see is more of a trade immersion program put together. One of the biggest bands here in the Seminole Nation is the uh, Tuskegee Hajo people. They're formerly the uh, Oconee people, which Nick and Nubby came from. And I believe they have like 3,500 members in their band. And I believe the Ojizi people are next in line for having the biggest band. And But uh, today we have a little over 18,000 enrolled members here in Oklahoma. As an outsider, I hope that the Oklahoma Seminole Nation and the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes in Florida get along. Are there governments getting along? Are there people getting along? Do you talk to each other? In regards to government and government, I wouldn't know that because I'm not a government official. In regards to me just talking to someone that's Istajati to another Istajati, I have good relationships with the people down in Florida. We're at a point in time where at the end of the day, still brothers and sisters and we're relatives. The only thing that separated us was some removal. I try to reach out to people out there in Florida. That's why I talk to Brian and Pedro so much is because they have a lot of knowledge. I try to get what they have and maybe I have something that, that they might want. So it, it's just more of just uh, working together in a system. We've got a group on Facebook where we can just share information and just talking about southeastern textiles. It's not just Seminoles. We have Choctaws and Cherokees in there also. So the kind of idea of different identities and good to work with them because the same materials they had at the time as what we had. Even though our clothing style is a little bit different, we still had the same materials. So I reached out to them because me, I'm pretty young. I'm 23. I'm trying to do everything right. Traditionally, what I've been taught was never make a full decision on your own. Always consult with an elder before you go through with anything. So I always refer to my elders because they're the ones who have the information. But what I'm trying to do and not do this for money, I'm just doing this for education purposes. And I'm trying to not just trying to sell it out. I'm just trying to inspire other people and try to show them that we're not exploiting the culture. And it's all just for make sure it's accurate and we tell our, our story in a respectful manner. The Supreme Court McGirt decision reminded everyone that the tribes are still here and need to be negotiated with in good faith. That's how they can make things right, to put us at a seat at the table that they excluded us from. In regards to criminal jurisdiction, but now we're in the planning process of putting taxation and trying to all the enterprises go back to the tribal nations in regards to that. Not just have it under criminal jurisdictions, but just having it to everything be under that respected tribal nation territory. Just like driving through another country, that's how the dealing should be with. As a chief of a nation should be seen as, as the president of the United States. For you, and I'm confident in the nation, sovereign autonomy is what you want. I want to see us be able to use our land without having to ask for permission. If I want to go hunting somewhere, I don't need to go pay a game warden for a license. If I want to go fishing, I wanted to do my own terms. If I want to start a garden or collect rainwater or dig a well, that would be under my own terms, not through any interference through the tribal government. That's what the whole premise of the Treaty of 1856 should have been. Jake, you see better times for Seminoles in the nation? We struggle. We're not as prosperous as, as the Seminole tribe of Florida would be with their hard rock enterprises or in terms of that. But one of the days, we will get to that point. It's going to take a lot of work, but it can be done. What do you do to celebrate Seminole Nation and to bring tourists in to see your culture in practice? In terms of the Seminole Nation, we have what we call Seminole Nation Days. That's always on the third weekend in September. And there's all kinds of stuff that happens throughout there. There's a softball tournaments or basketball tournaments, a stomp dance, traditional dress contest. We even have a carnival out there and a concert and sometimes even a powwow. We kind of see it as like a big family reunion where everybody can come together and have a good time. Talk about the tribal dress competition. In regards to the traditional dress, there's not a lot of people that have the education and how to differentiate <laughs> between a, a calico dress or a patchwork dress, and they kind of lump them both together. So it's a patchwork dress that wins first place over you know, the 1800s dress because they're going to gravitate what looks prettier, even though it's not historical accurate. I want to see, and I'll probably not be overseeing that in future years, separate the categories from traditional and contemporary. I don't want to put anyone down for having patchwork or anything like that, but we need to differentiate that. 
and not confuse anybody when we say traditional dress. Traditional clothing it didn't start in the early 1900s with the Singer sewing machines. It started way before that. And it didn't be nice pre-contact category also. Twining or feathered capes and tattooing, anything like that. The only thing we're trying to revert back to that is make it more culturally based. They have a concert and a powwow and carnival rides. And of course, that's not traditional. It's just for people to have fun. I think we need to allocate those funds into cultural preservation. We can still make it fun for everybody, but it also needs to make it educational. The past couple of years, I've set up with a lean-to camp out there and had all my camp gear out there and shown people what life was like in the early 1800s. You bring all this to the table as a historical interpreter. Like I said, I'm just saying a historical interpreter, but you kind of take it with a grain of salt, too, because when we talk about someone calls my clothing regalia, I'd rather just call it traditional clothing. It's called regalia, they call that a period of the time. I said, well, I'm still here, I'm still wearing it, so that's still traditional clothing. So we actually had battles here in Oklahoma during the Civil War, and they did the Heinz Springs Battle, which was the, the Gettysburg of the West. And all five tribes fought during that, and actually the first Kansas Infantry fought in that, the first African-American regiment that was in there that fought uh, during that. The group of Texas volunteers were in that. It was one of the biggest battles here in Oklahoma. We got the first battle, which was uh, around Mountain, with Seminoles and Creeks fought in also. When these re when these reenactments are held, how many Seminole Nation participants are there? There's not a lot of participation from tribal members. That's only I wanted to change that because a lot of people, when they think about the Civil War, they think about your typical Confederate or Union soldiers. They don't think about natives fighting there also and that internal conflict that we had while well, we had to be there. So we even have no rendezvous here too where we call the fur trappers, the mountain men. We set up, a lot of us, we try to stick to the 1840s mostly and then we just have a camp set up there and I went to the past weekend and there was no natives. I mean, I could have been that one, but like I said, I, with Native American Heritage Month, I've been all over the place and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to let someone else do the work for just one day. <laughs> I just want to go walk around and like have fun and so, you know, just stand in one place for many hours. Have you or would you participate in the Civil War living history demonstrations? For me, I would do the, the Union side because my band fought with the Union. So this is off actual historical evidence through my own research that my... What was the tribal composition of these forces? We're talking about the Battle of Honey Springs. On the Union side, there were the Cherokees, the Seminoles, and Creeks. And on the Confederate, you had Seminoles, Creeks, Cherokees, Choctaws, and Chickasaws. That shows you how that conflict went about. It was brother fighting against brothers. What is your feeling about non-Seminoles portraying Seminoles? This is a common practice in the Florida reenactments. Particularly, I would want to only have tribal members portraying Seminoles. But of course, there's a, a lot of non-natives down in Florida that do interpretations, and some of their work is really good. But just in regards to, I want to see my own people do it because that's their own identity, and it's their responsibility to pick that up. To me, it looked strange because to me, dressed up as a Daniel Boone, I'd be out there looking like a Seahola. You can make this an enjoyable thing. There's going to be a point in time where you're going to need these certain things, how to start a fire with the flint and steel and how to build a camp uh, before sundown or how to brain tan a beer in regards to that. There's so many aspects that you can do to have fun with it. You can make it enjoyable, but no, don't make it a mockery of it. I never get discouraged when I do an event. It's just me by myself because if I wasn't there, then it wouldn't have been done at all. But at least there's representation that's been put up there. It only just takes one spectator to, I don't need 100 people in the crowd. I just need one person in there that'll pick up anything that I've said. If, if that's done, then my job is complete. Jake, what would you like to say as we wrap up our discussion? Jake Tiger, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars. Thank you for having me out here. And it's good that we have someone out here, uh, out west here in Oklahoma that's on the show. So thanks for your time. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden. Roast em, provided by kind permission of Reedy Onman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.